um, welcome to Steph Jordan, who's going to talk to us about the future of the planet. And it's not scary. No. <laughs> it's a good, it's a little good, little it's a little good little message. Little I just want to get out of there. So yeah. Oh, is that a little bit scary? But oh, over to you, Steph. Okay. Here with our blankets. <laughs> Okay, so anyone recognize this ball over here? Our home? Yeah? Um, well, our home is on fire. Um, might also be a little bit underwater. Does anyone recognize this city? Yeah, it's here. This was Katrina. Katrina was a one in a hundred year event, except for these climate events are happening now every 10 years. And uh, despite what Elon Musk says, I don't really want to live on Mars. So we kind of have to face it, you know, there is no planet B. And eventually maybe we'll realize that when the last tree is cut down, and the last fish is eaten, and the last dream is poisoned, that maybe, just maybe, we can't eat money. And we really don't have long to change things. Um, this talk is not going to be a geeky number talk, but I just think it's important to state some key facts. This is from the Intergovernmental Climate Change Panel. 2030 is the date, and we are well, well, well away from our global targets. And I suppose the real question is, what kind of world would you all like to live in? Because the one that we're currently seeing on Netflix and on social is the desolate wasteland of Mad Max. And here's the thing about storytelling and culture. If we dream it, we can build it. So while all our energy is focused on the apocalypse and the doom and gloom, my invitation to you today is why not dream this better world? Anyone seen Black Panther? Wakanda forever? Why do we love Wakanda? We love Wakanda because this was an example where we could live with this evolved technological society all whilst living in harmony with Mother Nature. And you see, this is why I'm talking to you all today because it has become very clear and apparent to me that I need to be part of bringing this story to life. Because it isn't just climate change. It's irreversible biodiversity loss. And every single industry, including ours, has a role to play. So who am I? Well, my name is Stephanie Jordan. I am what you call a third culture kid. My father's from Colombia, my mother's British. I was raised in France. Not just anywhere, I was raised just below this rock, actually. This is La Roche de Solutre. Any wine nerds in the room? Yeah? So this is uh, Bourgogne, southern Mâconnais. This is the birthplace of Chardonnay, okay? And this was my first true connection to terroir, to land to understanding that what was happening around me climatically was impacting this raw material, this grape, which was so apparent and important to the beating heart of our economy locally. My father today still makes wine in the region. And so it's a place whereby I felt truly connected with Gaia and a place which has consequently brought me on a journey now 20 years into my career where I understand that first and foremost, we are an industry of agriculture. And so six years ago, I co-founded a brand called Avalen, Avalen Calvados, on a mission to be the world's most planet positive spirits brand. And five years later, we've proved our point quite a few times over. But why the need to innovate in drinks? And why is our industry so accountable? Well, many of you might know that the uh, global flying aviation industry accounts for 1% of global emissions. But our industry is four. And this is talking about spirits and drinks. This will include soft drinks. This will exclude food. Because if I bring food in, which essentially we're talking about our hospitality industry, we're looking at something like 28%. So our accountability 
here in this room right now is immense. And our ability to start to understand what great tasting drinks that don't give the planet a hangover, for me, is fundamentally the future of our industry. And, and why do I think it's so important? Not because we're 4%, but because we are culture. Every story worth telling was told in a bar. Every revolution started around a drink. The power we have within our venues to really you know, inspire is just profound. And at the end of the day, and I love Gaz, um, he's from Yorkshire, which is where my husband's from, but Gaz wrote this letter, open letter, to a bartender that was published um, at Tales, and he said, you know, bartenders really do have the power to change the world, and so the mission and the quest I'm on today is how can I inspire enough bartenders to understand how they can make informed and conscious decisions that will indeed transform our industry for the better. Right, some facts. We don't like these facts, they make us a bit uncomfortable. Sustainability has become a bit emotional. Uh, we like to plastic shame, you know, plastic straws and plastic bottles. Uh, unfortunately, plastic currently is better than glass. Yeah, we are obsessed with our single use glass bottles here, aren't we? Other facts. What you buy is actually more important than where it comes from. Recycling is broken, I'm sorry to tell you. Um, and your garnish probably doesn't matter that much when it comes to saving the world. And lastly, and we'll talk about this a lot, water. Water of life. We are water, but water is the number one problem we are going to face, and our industry consumes a hell of a lot of water. Some spirits more than others. And so I'm gonna break this down into two parts. First of all, I'm gonna take you on a little journey around what it is to try and produce positive impact spirit brands. And then the second section, we'll look at, well, how is that brought to life in an operational perspective? So what is a bottle of booze? Well, hopefully, if we're doing things properly, pretty much all bottles of alcohol start in a field of some kind, unless you're air vodka, which apparently is literally made from oxygen. But we would say all spirits brands begin in the fields. And so what is very interesting here is that what we're actually looking at is monocrops, monocultures. So whether we are a gin or a whiskey or a rum or a vodka, we are in fact made from monocrops more times than not. And so what is a monocrop? A monocrop is an environment whereby we grow a single product. Uh, a great example will be, for example, in Kentucky with corn. This is where you will see no other biodiversity, nothing but fields and fields and fields of corn, often using heaps of pesticides, artificial irrigation. And in fact, this is where we're seeing the most impact. And when I say impact, I'm talking really about the environmental consequences of this modern agriculture. You see, we like to pretend in the drinks industry that we are an industry of craft and small and niche produce, but we are first and foremost an industry of farmers, followed by an industry of industrialization, and lastly, an industry of marketing. And that really is the order in which things are. And so for me, when six years ago, I co-founded this delicious Calvados, I understood that it began in the fields. And so when I looked at these main raw materials that we use to make alcohol, it became really clear to me that the base material needed to come from regeneration. Okay, has anyone ever been to like a traditional orchard? Yeah? These are wonderful mosaic habitats. These are places whereby we find a bunch of different pollinators, a bunch of different varietals. We obviously have natural sequestration because our fruit are growing on trees, which as we know is one of our key climate solutions. And depending on where your orchard is grown, it may or may not need irrigation. And so if anyone has ever been to Normandy in France, we have an appellation d'origine contrôlée, a French AOC that protects the terroir, the region, the produce. And under that AOC, our orchards may not be irrigated. They are fully protected from pesticides. We have 200 varieties of apples. 
120 varieties of pears. And here, when I talk to you about Dawa spirit, I am telling you that we can follow from blossom to bottle everything that is going on with our Calvados. And that really should be the norm. But unfortunately, it is not. And so when we start to understand and look at emissions of a single bottle of booze, one metric that is important is CO2, CO2E. And so you'll find many drinks brands now offsetting and telling you that they've planted some trees in Timbuktu to try and minimize their impact. <laughs> but what I'm talking to you about is integrating your impact, your solution within your supply chain in itself. Why go plant trees if you can already grow your fruit from them? you insert your climate solution within your production. And so we have done extensive research now, life cycle analysis and so forth, and we've been able to prove that making alcohol from apples grown in traditional orchards actually does more good for the planet than not. And then there's this other key metric, water. On the front of our label, we claim that we're made with apples, water, and thyme. I say we claim because you shouldn't believe us or anyone else for that matter. The drinks industry likes to tell a lot of gobbledy, <coughs> gobbledy lies. You have to make sure that we prove it to you. Everything is about transparency. So in our case, we work with blockchain technology. We have a third party verification company called Provenance that basically certifies independently every claim that we make. These are the only ingredients that go into Avalon. But water isn't just important as an ingredient that you use maybe to dilute your ABV. Water is the essence of everything that we do. And when we start to look at the production side of things, not just that industry side of what's happening in a distillery, but the agricultural side of water and irrigation, and we start to do the maths, it is disproportionate to make alcohol from grain compared to it might be making alcohol from something like sugarcane or fruit that already has direct access to the source of our alcohol, which is sugar, okay? So when we're going one step back and we're starting with starch, <laughs> we're gonna need a lot more energy, a lot more water to get that starch into sugar, to get that sugar to ferment into alcohol. So getting that fructose is kind of the key to things. So that's what's happening in the fields. But of course, as I said, we're not just an industry of farmers. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's a huge disconnect between the producers and the farmers themselves. Very rarely are drinks companies actually accountable for what's happening in the fields. They are buying a commodity. They are buying a traded raw material, okay? Who loves scotch? I love scotch. Okay. Scotch is made from? Okay. <coughs> Grown where? Where is this barley grown? In the UK, yeah? Do we think all the barley that we use to make scotch from Scotland grows in the UK? No. Actually, the huge majority of it comes from the grain belt, which is actually Ukraine and Russia and Romania, okay? And so what tends to happen is that distillers, they are accountable for what's happening here, right? But what is going on in those barley fields in Romania? Not their land, not their people, not their business. And this is why we need to start to reconnect these dots. This is important. The majority of our industry is focused at this level, which is the industrial side of things. Why? Again, because we are primarily an industrialized industry. There are 10 global companies that dominate more than 90% of all global spirit sales. And this is where they're focused because this is where they feel they can have the most impact. And that does make sense. So looking at energy efficiencies and also waste management, all of these programs around implementing water recycling programs are essential. And a lot of your ambassadors and sales reps will probably be able to talk to you about specific things happening at a distillery level. And then let's get to this really important, uncomfortable truth. We're made in a field, we're distilled, then in an industrial location, and we get this delicious liquid, which we obsessively, obsessively want to put inside a very heavy, fragile vessel known as a single-use glass bottle. Why are we so obsessed with glass? Glass is a great material. It is safe for the liquid, it doesn't impact flavor, 
But in essence, when we start shipping this all around the world, it doesn't make sense. Now, yes, you can recycle glass, but unfortunately, the energy required to do so just doesn't quite make sense. Have any of you heard of Eco Spirits? The little green box that here hanging out at the front? Yeah? So these are some stats from my good friends there. Um, they estimated that in 2021, 70 billion single-use glass bottles were consumed just in spirits. And the worst thing is that that number is actually going to go up to 90 billion by 2030. Now, unfortunately, as I said, recycling doesn't really work with glass because we need nearly as, as much energy to recycle it as we do to make a new bottle. So what do we do? What's our solution? Actually, there are heaps of solutions. Our industry has been innovating for the past <laughs> 10 years with a whole heap of different things from, I have an example of a paper bottle, a bag in <laughs> bottle, bag in box. We have examples of recycled aluminum cans. We have kegs. We have refillable pouches. We have a whole series as well of on tap solutions. Yet these are still the exception and not the rule. And it's concerning to me that this isn't <laughs> accelerating because again, we need to look at the hard facts. Bigger is better. It really is. When it comes to transporting liquid, whether it's into a bar or around the world, the size of your vessel has impact. So being able for us as spirits producers, A, to have a sell-in option in a larger format is essential. And B, for many of you as operators, to have an ability as well to work with this kind of refill circular system. And a little more information here on eco-spirits, because eco-spirits are one of those things that arrives in your life and you think, my goodness, this is going to be really hard to implement. But actually, it's just so simple. We're simply saying that there is not a waste problem in the world. There is a design problem. And we can resolve everything by looking to nature and understanding that how we organize and become a circular economy and work as an ecosystem together, we are able to transform things. Now, at the end of the day, I think we can all agree that we just want to have a great bloody tasting drink that doesn't give the planet a hangover, right? And we can achieve this. Um, so Eco Spirits, if you don't know it, I have a little eco tote here for you to see. And if you want more information, I will connect you with the US program here with Z. Mm -hmm. But truly, truly, this is, they call it the end of single use glass revolution. But what I love so much about their mission and agenda is that they talk about positive, irreversible transformation. And that's the key here. This isn't a trend. Nothing on these slides are trends. This isn't the future and next week we'll talk about something else. This is fundamentally the shift that we have to go on together as an industry. And yes, Avalon is available in an Ecoto in five cities, in fact. And yes, a circular future is a healthier planet. Aluminium. Anyone seen these anywhere? Anyone UK based? Yep. Fabulous. So this is Sustainaholics. This was an initiative created by a guy called David, which is focused basically on global travel and retail. Now, global travel has historically liked larger formats. Um, however, the number one main concern of maybe a cruise carrier or an airline or a train tends to be weight and storage. So these classic little heavy glass 5CL minis don't make much sense. And so moving into this post-recycled aluminium can format which A, is less fragile than glass, B, less heavy than glass, C, requires less water and is eternally recyclable, all of a sudden becomes a very viable solution. Now, these brands here are part of a sustainable uh, independent brand collection. Basically, it, we're a community of brands that have come together. But Grey Goose have this uh, format available as well on airlines globally. So I think looking to some of our peers as well in beer, Recycled aluminium, and it's so important that it's recycled. Virgin aluminium is not better than glass. So if ever you are working with this format or people are selling you beverages in this format, please make sure that it is post-recycled. But this format is one that is already readily available to us, and it just tends to be a 
perception of maybe image and quality that we need to overcome because this is better than glass. But if you are a purist or a somewhat traditionalist and you want your booze in a bottle shape, well, here we have it. This is frugal pack. Now, frugal pack is 94% cardboard, not lined, with a food grade plastic pouch and an aluminium cap. All of these three pieces are recyclable. Uh, again, recycling is broken, but until we are able to transition to a circular world, we are looking for the least bad option within a series of not great options, um, much like sometimes politics in this country. But um, <laughs> moving on, what I love about this, this is an open patent. Sustainability should not be a competitive advantage. Sustainability is our collective responsibility. So when brand A comes up with their own innovative paper bottle design and brand B does also the same thing, but none of them are talking to each other and no one is learning from one another, that is concerning to me. So Frugal Pack is available for every brand to use. It is a format whereby we can all collectively together start to replace these single use glass bottles. I have one here for you to see. Um, really great for pre-batching and also fantastic for e-com and retail. And available in the US. So there's a couple of wine brands, tequila brands and vodka brands that are working with this format. And I've already seen them on shelf at Trader Joe's and Whole Foods. So next time you're there and you want to check it out, try and see if you can find one in an aisle. You will be very surprised about how lightweight and robust they are. And so how do I bring this back to the bar setting? Because on one hand, as I said, we're an ecosystem. So we have us, the, the producers, those that make your delicious booze, and then there's you, and you're the ones that then have to bring this to life for your customers. And so one of my rallying cries is bring back biodiversity to the bar. First and foremost, when I sit across a bar and I look at the back bar, I'm seeing monocrop, 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 primarily grain, sugarcane, a little bit of grape maybe. I'm not seeing much fruit. I'm not seeing much waste backs. There's so many alternative sources for which we can make alcohol. And so I think that is something which if you could just do one thing, they say eat the rainbow, I say drink the rainbow, okay? So look to that raw material that your spirit is being made from and make sure that you have a potato base, a sugar beet waste, uh, uh, you know, there's about 10 different basic categories, um, but still my favorite will always be fruit. Um, and when I'm speaking about eating the rainbow, I just want to touch upon something simple here. When we talk about the climate, often it comes back around our meat consumption, our dairy consumption, and I think it's just a consideration as a venue that perhaps has a food program to balance out that menu with a at least 50-70% plant-based against your meat and dairy offering is a tremendous way that you can immediately start to see some positive outcomes when it comes to your total emissions. Anna Sebastian, I don't know if any of you have met her before, she's a bar consultant based in the UK. She has this 70-30 rule that I love. And basically when she goes into any big establishment, I'll use the example recently, London, the Raffles Hotel, she understands that she needs to do deals with these bigger companies that have the recognized brands, the reputations, of course, the budgets and so on. So she keeps 70% of the menu open to them, ensuring that the 30% of the drinks menu at any given point is kept for independent brands, brands that are looking to do sustainable things, brands that are minority owned, brands that are just in a completely different category that isn't maybe a big five, a big five being whiskey, gin, vodka, rum, and agave-based. Industry is obsessed with the big five categories. If you're anything outside of that, you're a bit floofy. They don't really know what to do with you. So I think having this rule as well is a really easy, simple way to have immediate impact in terms of your uh, holistic approach to sustainability. Because sustainability is planet and, of course, people. So that ownership piece here around minority-owned, female-owned, I think is so important. And additionally to that, I would also look at the origins of the products you're buying. There's a big conversation around ownership in Mexico, around all the agave-based distilleries, who's actually making the money, whereas it's actually going back to other local communities who have been guardians of these sacred agaves for centuries, are they receiving the income? So something else to think about when you are curating your selection. As we said before, water 
the water of life. It is our biggest and most precious resource. Anything you can do within your bar to immediately reduce your consumption and really hold water in the highest regard, I strongly recommend. Um, probably water is currently your biggest waste in any operating venue. So please use your ice machines wisely. Um, serve your drinks without ice if you can. Chill them, pre-dilute them before. And if anything, uh, capture used ice and use it again. And a sort of closing point around your customers. It's so important that we have dialogue and conversation. As I said before, culture happens around the dinner table, around the bar with a great drink in hand. And so feeling and communicating these things, taking your customers on a journey, having them ask questions, writing specific captions on menus around having a sustainable curated spirit selection and being really open and conscious around these choices, I think is fundamental. Please always remember the four R's, reduce, reuse, repair and recycle. Why are they important? Because they go in that order. Recycling is the last thing we need to be doing. The first one is reducing, the second one reusing, and finally repairing. This is a mantra that you can take into every aspect of your life. If even some of these tips feel slightly overwhelming, then one thing you can do today is buy ethical and sustainable brands. We have accreditation such as B Corp that allow for, for you essentially to make an informed decision without having to do all the homework. And there are quite a few sites that exist already that have done that homework for you. And I wanted to leave you with, I, I think it's a gift. It's, um, it's a new model. Um, I believe capitalism has failed us, is failing us, and, and the rich are eating the poor, and it's kind of scary. Um, and so it's really, really hard sometimes to try and imagine a different world and see how you, this small little drop of ocean that you are, can actually have impact on the shape of the global economy or the way that you know global politics are going. And yet, there's this really simple model. It's called donut economics, um, envisioned by a, a British woman, Kate. And essentially, she realized that this graph, this curve that we're obsessed with, this finite growth, you know, this one line that keeps going forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, it's, it's going to take us absolutely nowhere to our, our utmost destruction. GDP as a unit of measure is not the way that we can determine whether we are a thriving species living in harmony with Mother Earth. And so she's redesigned the economy into a donut shape. And so what is fantastic and so inspiring about this simple model is that, again, our ability to dream things is our ability to build and create them. And so through this donut, the external part of the donut are our natural boundaries, okay? And the inside of the donut is all the social requirements that we need to be a happy and healthy people living in community and society. And so her suggestion is that we operate economically within the gooey bit of the donut. And so if every single company, every single brand, every single bar could apply this exercise and sit down with a couple of post-its and try and understand how they could shape their business to work against these metrics versus just revenue as a single source of growth, I think here already we have a solution, and that is something that we are evolving to. So six years down the line, after having launched Avalon Spirits, my business partner and myself, Tim, are now looking at how we can bring all these learnings to life and have tremendous impact at scale by applying these learnings from Donut Economics and helping other drinks brands and bar operators improve across all these key metrics. And so I will leave you with a leaving four, which is that essentially the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. Um, it's up to every single one of us to do our bit. And if you are uh, inspired and would like to know more, I've put a selection of resources here, of some things that have been inspiring me lately. Um, and I just want to thank you for taking the time to sit in the room and listen to this conversation because your awareness and your curiosity is already one step of the way. Um, but I truly do believe that together we can be the change. And so... Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Tales.